Hey everybody, uh, today I am taking the kayak out with a little bit of collecting gear to go and see what we can find. Mostly going out to do some video and photo work, but we'll see if there's anything interesting to bring back for school and educational purposes. Uh, it's a nice day out, getting ready to get out of the water. So all this is nice shallow water along the mangrove shores, but we're also going to head over to the bridge where there's some man-made structures as well. And that's why you can find a lot of diversity in this area. So it was time to get out of the kayak and start wading around looking for something interesting to pop in the water for. And lo and behold, here is a little blue crab. And it is so cool to see how well they can literally bury themselves in seconds. And floating along here, right at the bottom, is a red mangrove propagule. These are awesome because they literally build the shoreline and help protect it from erosion. And you can see how effective they are by just lifting my head out of the water. And there they are. Look at all the mangroves holding, on, holding down the shoreline. We made it to the bridge. Man-made structures like this can provide very interesting habitats for marine life under the water. But even though it's not too deep, it's still good enough for a little bit of a free dive to about 10-15 feet. A lot of the schools of fish you see around here are different species of grunts. There's some French grunts, some tomtates, things like that. However, as I was looking around, something caught my eye. Something rather big and active. A spotted moray. And this, uh, this moray was definitely very excited, going after something, looking for food. Very fun to watch. All the other fish are waiting around for possible scraps. You'll have to excuse the little smudge on these frames. A little air bubble got in there and kind of messed up some of my shots. Here is a small horse conch. Now horse conchs are the Florida state shell and they're predatory snails, which is cool. And I say small because this actually gets much, much larger as it gets older. Now you do have to be careful around some of these rocks. Do you see the scorpion fish? It's right there between the two rocks, almost under the one. They are venomous, but they're pretty docile. There's a bunch of little fish here, but check out if you can see the little sharp nose puffer right there in the bottom right. I'm going to be zooming up on a pin shell and pin shells are actually really big. They're large bivalves and they're mostly covered in the sand. You can only see the tip coming out there. You can see the slit where it's filter feeding. Right in those rocks you can see some orange clawed hermits hanging on. I'm probably going to bring a few of those back with me. And ah, the infamous spot still with us. But I love to see the schools of fish and swimming through them. It's quite a lot of fun and a nice ending. Except I've got one more fish to show you and it's called a lizard fish. And I don't always see them. They're kind of reclusive. They're hard to get close to, but they're really neat looking. Oh, there he goes. Now it's time for a leisurely paddle back and such an amazing environment. So I'm back from the field and it's time to unbox the bucket I brought back with a few critters in there. So today's really unique because I actually brought back two fish, which is something I don't usually do. One is a sharp nose puffer and one is a high hat. Both of them are juveniles. And as adults, they would actually stay small enough to be in my systems for long term, which is really important. Uh, I have per on my permit, I have about 30 days when I can actually re-release them into the wild. And during that period of time, I'm going to make sure that they are doing well, they're eating, they, um, they don't have any parasites, they're clean, things like that. If for some reason they have issues, then within that 30 days, I will pop them back out into the wild, no harm, no foul. Um, if they make it through that, then they can become part of the systems and they can stay for long term which is really important. I also brought back a couple of hermits that are of a different species, and I'll get into that in a minute. So just to know what I'm getting into, 
I brought out my handy dandy refractometer. Now this will allow me to measure the salinity. And so I'm just gonna take a sample of the water from the ocean, uh, where the critters were from, and gonna look in here and see what I got. And we're at about, about 35 parts per thousand, which makes sense because I was out during a high tide near the inlet, and that means that there was probably a lot of uh, good old ocean water coming in. Average salinity for the ocean is around 35 parts per thousand. Now, my tanks are usually going to be a little lower than that, but this one might actually be about that. And here we go. Yeah, just about that. About 35 parts per thousand. And that's good because um, they're, the salinities are very similar. What that means is that I'm really looking at temperature difference being the major factor here that I need to worry about. And so one of the things we'll do is, first of all, I'm going to use this smaller bucket for the fish to transition them in. And I'm going to start them out in a shallow pool of the water from this bucket. And that way, they're going to go directly in there, same water. And then what I'll do is I'll slowly bring some water in from these 10 gallons and mix with it until the temperature uh, becomes equalized between the two. So the little puffer is actually hanging out right here on top of these little snails I brought in. Looks like I got the high hat first. And in you go. A little puffer. In you go. There they are, getting acclimated. Now we're gonna start pouring some of the other tank water in. So I'm here in the lab table and I brought one of the hermit crabs that I brought in. These are what we call orange clawed hermit crabs. They get a little bigger than the blue legs that I got before, but they serve much the same purpose. Hey guys, it's been about uh, a half hour that I've been transitioning the water in with these fish. So they're ready to go to the tank now, but I do have one last step and that is doing what we call a freshwater dip. So this, uh, this bowl essentially is full of RO water that I used to, before I put salt in, so it's really fresh. And why we do this is very simple. They could be bringing in a lot of parasites, things like that, and I wanna make sure that we clean them off. And what happens is the, parasite cells on their skin will essentially lice uh, in the different osmotic pressures between the salt water and the fresh water. Now of course we can't leave the fish in this for any length of time. It's a very quick thing. It's not 100% effective but it's a great little tool uh, to help increase their chances of getting rid of anything we don't want. And it's really quick especially with small fish. So here's the little puffer. I'm gonna put it in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's enough. Now I'm gonna put it all in the tank. Two, there you go. I like to try as many non-chemical ways, very naturalistic ways, to reduce any parasites as possible, just because uh, it's possible that I may release these guys within the next couple of weeks before my time is up and I want to make sure I haven't added anything to their environment that would be dangerous to go back out into the wild. So that's one of the reasons why freshwater dips are really quick and easy to do. And the puffer fish is right behind the little intake tube of the filter. All right guys, so the fish are introduced, uh, the crabs are introduced, and everything is good for today. So uh, I'll keep you updated on their progress and until next time, keep exploring.